Okay, thank you very much uh, to ICT and all the fantastic people who make this great event possible year after year. We were initially mad that you stole a sock from us, but we're very grateful you loaned them back for a short period of time. Um, and again, thank you so, so much for being such great hosts. Um, the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point have sent representatives to this event for the past four or five years or so, I believe. Uh, usually it's been our former director, uh, Brian Price. In fact, this is such a value trip that the only way that I could pry him out and get myself over here was to force him to retire from the Army. Uh, and it worked. He's out. I'm in. Two months later, I'm here in Herzliya. So who's the big winner now? All right. Um, I'm going to do something a little uh, unconventional. I'll ask everybody to tune out for the next 20 seconds or so. Check your phones, Instagram, whatever, because I need to have a private conversation with any U.S. government attorneys who happen to be in the room or watching on YouTube later. So here we go. This presentation is my own view and not that of the U.S. Military Academy, the Department of the Army, or any agency of the U.S. government. Okay, we're back. All right. Um, so what I want to talk about today uh, with such a remarkable group of terrorism specialists uh, is the use of primary source material in our field, specifically the use of captured documents. For those of you who know the CTC, you know that this is how we cut our teeth as an organization. Fifteen years ago, we began producing research using captured enemy material based on our relationships inside the U.S. Department of Defense. Credit for this goes to that era, era of CTCers. Some of those people who are merely emerging names at the time, but who have grown to become really some of the heavyweights in our field. Uh, Brian Fishman, Will McCants, Jared Brockman, Joe Felter, and of course, Asaf, who is near and dear to, to both of our hearts here. Um, and that went on for some time, uh, but then it actually slowed down a bit. The CDC continued to produce research, of course, but less was based on captured enemy material. And this was for two reasons. One, with both major theaters, Iraq and Afghanistan, in the midst of a drawdown, there simply wasn't as much material being gathered. And two, more problematic, uh, for the stuff that was there, we found more resistance to using it for this type of broader strategic uh, academic work. Yes, we got a few bin Laden documents back in 2012, but 17 out of thousands isn't exactly a watershed moment, and it took another five years for the rest of uh, UBL's at-home library to come out into the public domain. Um, well, as the ISIS challenge grew and, and as some especially innovative thinkers in the U.S. government were coming to the fore, uh, we found the tides shifting. Um, and over the past year or two, we've really made some significant progress uh, in terms of providing access to and support for the, the public release of captured material. And this progress paid off with a couple shorter CTC pieces uh, earlier this year that we used to test our processes to do this type of work. One was a short article in our Sentinel publication um, that we released a couple months ago on rosters taken from an Islamic State female guest house in Syria. Uh, another was a report written by my colleague, Dr. Daniel Milton, uh, that we actually released last week. Uh, and he used Islamic State documents captured in Afghanistan to identify how the Islamic State, or IS, managed its media organization and exercised control over the media activities of its disparate wilayat, or provinces. But the project I want to mostly talk about here today is a long-term and deep assessment uh, that we are currently doing of the Islamic, State Khoras Islamic State's Khorasan province, or ISK. Um, this actually nests very well uh, with the panel, the excellent panel that we had before lunch, because in talking about the future of global jihad, we actually didn't really touch on Afghanistan, Pakistan area, uh, which, of course, as we all know, is the, uh, um, the, the source of, of a lot of the fun we've been having over the last couple of years. Um, so uh, what we're doing in this project is we're examining uh, a large number of documents captured in Afghanistan that cover a wide range of ISK activities, most significant ones being media, recruitment, governance, finance, operations, and organizational structure. Um, there are also some really interesting documents that covered some niche areas and things like innovation and technology, uh, child recruitment, um, and problems inside the organization. So examining this material, we hope, will help us answer our broader and central research question, which initially was, how do we explain ISK's organizational resilience in the face of what's been a pretty heavy counterterrorism uh, effort against it over the past three plus years. And at this point, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank someone who's instrumental in all of this, uh, Major Paul Leshenko, uh, who's a U.S. Army intelligence officer in the Special Operations Community, and he's here this week. It's dark out there, so I can't see you, Paul. Uh, but uh, in addition to being a great soldier, uh, Paul is a great thinker on these issues, and he really helped move this project forward for us. Uh, in fact, hosted us out in Afghanistan for the data collection phase of this project. So, so thanks for that, Paul. Um, although I'm not sure if you thank somebody for bringing you to Afghanistan, but, um, but that's okay. Um, kidding, though, of course, that actually was an absolutely critical uh, part of this process and is really essential for any project like this is to get out there and, and see what's happening. 
Um, so anyways, uh, that's a pretty broad research question and has necessarily led to, necessarily led to several subtopics that we focused on. One of these, and the one that I'm going to talk about here today, uh, is understanding the relationship between ISK and the Islamic State's overall leadership in Iraq and Syria. Obviously, the degree to which Khorasan is receiving support from the state uh, plays a significant role in determining the key drivers of its own resilience. Um, as most of you in this room are well aware, there's been a fair amount of really useful and interesting work done on terrorist group uh, alliances and cooperation. Much, but not all of this work, however, uh, given when it came out, was based primarily on AQ and using AQ as its primary case studies. These studies of AQ affiliates has shown varying degrees of interest in adhering to the guidance provided by AQ Core. Uh, but even that range went only from those who outright challenged AQ, uh, such as you know, AQI, ISI, ISIS, depending on what time period we're talking about, uh, to those who respectfully adhered to some of the guidelines, uh, but chose to ignore others when it didn't really suit their, their local needs. But what based, based on what we're seeing so far in ISK, however, is that this is a wilayat that appears to be doing everything it can uh, to tow the party line. And where it can't, it answers for its failures. Uh, more to follow on that in a few minutes. From its side, it's certainly clear that overall the Islamic State was intensely interested in exercising central control of its far-flung provinces. We found many documents that were generic guidance, uh, which provided detailed instructors, instructions on a wide variety of, of topics, um, including media. These were the documents I referred to earlier that my, my colleague Daniel wrote a report on. Um, HISPA, broader judicial processes, zakat, dawa, management of finances, um, a host of, of uh, instructional material. Um, they even provided hundreds of blank templates and forms uh, to ISK for the Wilayat to use as it began establishing its presence in Afghanistan. It's like the Islamic State starter pack, right? You too can be a Wali. Just sign up, receive this pack of materials, and you're well on your way to having your own Wali, right? Um, now, of course, we've seen groups like uh, groups send out guidance like this in the past, but based on our initial assessment of this data, the level of detail and frequency of communication is truly noteworthy. Um, and we see significant back and forth between the two entities. It, IS isn't just sending out templates and documents and hoping for the best. They follow up with specific questions and requests for information to assess the progress made by the Wali. There are some interesting exchanges that we see in the data, uh, with some showing a clear eagerness by ISK to please its masters. One letter was a response from a chief ISK deputy, uh, Abdul Hasib, to the Caliph, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, in it, he says, and I'm quoting, thank you for asking me to send you a message. We are happy that our emirs watch over us, which funnily is exactly how I respond to all of my boss's emails, too, <laughs> except I call her colonel, not emir, which is probably better. Um, of course, we soon see why he's being so nice, because after several paragraphs talking about how well they're doing, how great recruitment is going, uh, he then uh, branches into talking about their desperate need for more weapons, and that while he appreciates the money that was sent, it's only 20% of their needs, so keep it coming, please. Um, there are quite a number of letters from IS to ISK asking for information and data, uh, and not all responses are as diplomatic as Abdul Hasib's was. One letter was from an official named Yusuf in the ISK media office to his sheikhs back in an unspecified IS committee, presumably the media one, um, who had apparently chastised him for not sending in his required military reports. In it, he does what most of us are tempted to do when our boss challenges us, and that is he gives excuses. Um, he tells them that the brothers have been subjected to continuous bombing for the past three weeks, and that their media office has been completely destroyed. So way to go, Paul. You got Yusuf in trouble. Thanks, man. <laughs> Um, he says that their cameras were destroyed, as was their printer. He then points out that this was their only printer, and though most of the time they didn't have any ink for it. Um, so I think we can all sympathize with ink and toner struggles. Um, he then rattles off a list of accumulating problems. All their locations are known to the enemy. It's unfortunate. Uh, electricity is non-existent, leading them to rely on solar, which doesn't meet their needs. Uh, and, when it, and of course, he says that their internet network coverage is poor, and when it does work, it's incredibly slow. So slow that they can't even upload single images or files. Now, working for the U.S. Army, I can certainly sympathize with horrendous internet service. Um, I feel your pain, brothers. They're facing missiles and bombs. I'm facing an army of lawyers and contracting regulations that prevent me from simply ordering a new router on Amazon Prime. So I'm not sure what's worse. Anyway, uh, despite the excuses we saw in this particular case, we did see regular responses from ISK to these requests for information. ISK's Wally sent regular updates of operations and activities back to the Caliph. The language of the ones we did see indicated that these were uh, should, probably should have been monthly reports um, and were framed that way, but so far we've only recovered a couple of them. Uh, one of the most significant data calls we saw was a February 20, 2017 letter from the Islamic State to the ISK Wali, Abdul Hasib, who had been promoted uh, after the killing of Hafiz Saeed Khan, uh, that contained a list of seven requests. And those requests are, number one, 
A report containing information on all your soldiers to include name, date of birth, number of wives, number of children, weapons, what military course you've taken, what Sharia course they've taken. Number two, an inventory of all the Wilayat's weapons. Number three, explanation of any Sharia problems in the Wilayat. Four, explanation of any financial administrative problems plus solutions. Uh, five, clarification of your geographic presence. Number six, explanation of military plans and operations. And number seven, monthly budget. Uh, we're still looking to see if they responded to all these requests, but the one that did jump out was that uh, Shortly thereafter, ISK did send back to the Islamic State a very professional and detailed spreadsheet providing all of that info I mentioned in number one, all that personal biographical information. Uh, and they provided this for 1,805 fighters across four regions. They even included a nice cover tab uh, that had summary statistics for all the mentioned categories. So for every staff officer in the room, you'd be incredibly impressed by what they pulled off. Uh, I've so far been describing some of the top level overarching communications, but we see this level of communication happening regularly across a range of more specific functional areas. I'll uh, highlight a couple to dive a little deeper on. Um, first, finances. This was a regular topic of conversation, uh, and these usually consisted of ISK asking for more money and IS responding with requests for more information, presumably to instill confidence that it would be money well spent. Early in its existence, 2015, 2016 timeframe, ISK clearly relied on receiving funds directly from IS in Iraq and Syria. They regularly discussed the mechanics of moving funds from the Levant to Afghanistan and all the challenges they encountered along the way. Uh, the Wali is quite blunt with the Caliph on a number of occasions when things are not going well, pointing out in one letter, right now we are confronting a financial crisis worth mourning. Um, and he points out that he's having trouble paying stipends and salaries. He also shrewdly recognizes that he's actually in competition with the other Wilayat uh, around the world for funds, saying, the status of Khorasan differs from the rest of the Wilayat in that there's so many problems here. He's highlighting the highly competitive militant landscape in, uh, in Afghanistan and suggesting that he needs funds more than the other Wilayats uh, and his counterparts spread elsewhere around the world. Uh, by August, however, in one of his monthly updates, he said they'd actually have finally been able to start paying more salaries. Not clear if these two are tied, to get, collect, uh, excuse me, tied together, but interesting nonetheless. So at the management level, uh, senior management level, we also see regular communications between representatives discussing specifically how to move these funds back and forth. Um, over time, they seem to be in, uh, encountering more difficulties. And what we see into 2017 and 2018 is less communication about money coming directly from the core um, and more reliance on fundraising uh, locally uh, in Afghanistan. The second category to discuss is organization and governance. As mentioned above, there's a very large amount of material captured that demonstrates how far IS went to provide ISK with all the systems, processes, and tools needed to follow the caliphate's path. This includes org charts for uh, uh, Diwan of Dawah and Mosque, Diwan of Zakat and al hispa Islamic police, uh, work processes for judicial systems, um, templates for how to document judicial issues and police activity. Uh, also recovered was a series of letters from the Emir of Diwan al hispa at the IS level to all the regional Wali at the Walayat around the world with specific guidance on a range of topics, including beard shaving, long hair for youth, imported meat products, stopping male doctors from treating women, cheating in trades, a variety of specific issues. Um, again, ISK didn't just quietly receive these missives. They sometimes went back to IS asking for guidance on specific issues. In one case, uh, there was a couple brothers who were sowing discord in the ranks, and they sent a letter back to, to CORE asking, hey, you know, what's, what's some advice you can give us on how to handle this situation? All right, the final area I want to cover is media. On this topic, I encourage you to go check out our website, check out that report I mentioned earlier. Um, that report focused specifically on IS uh, and its communications with all of its Wilayat. It found that IS's D1 of central media used numerous policies and programs to centralize control over the propaganda production process. These communications range from high-level policy documents uh, explaining the D1's approach to media operations to all the way down to very specific guidance regarding the most effective camera angles to use in certain shots. Lists of questions, sam like sample questions you can use if you're going out and interviewing a member of the public. Um, this is all covered in that report. What isn't covered, uh, however, is uh, that we also found numerous documents specific to ISK's relationship with, uh, with the Islamic State um, in, uh, in the media domain. IS communicated very specific requests to ISK to include a message from the editors of the IS weekly newsletter, al Napa. Uh, with questions for the ISK Wali to answer for an article, and guidance that each answer should be 200 words and include specific information instead of just general talking, which is probably what Stevie and Jonathan want to tell all of us speakers here at this conference this week. Um, and ISK regularly communicated back with explanations of challenges it was having in the production of media. Finally, uh, we see evidence that when IS sends out documents outlining certain policies, they're actually put into practice, or at least they attempt to put them into practice. 
For example, one of their media guidance documents talks about the review process for materials, specifically that ISK or any Wiley, for that matter, is not allowed to issue official media releases on its own, but rather has to run every product back through the ISD one of central media. One might have thought that to be impractical and maybe not followed all the time, just too hard, communications, all that. Um, but sure enough, we find in their files multiple examples of media products that had been edited and commented on by IS and ultimately indications of final approval for release. Uh, so yes, IS has mastered track changes in Word. It's all over now. Um, while we've seen that IS exerted its influence across a variety of areas, it's in media that it exercises the most control. This makes sense for two reasons. One, the overall importance it places on media, but we all know this, it's oft discussed. Um, but two, it has a greater ability to verify compliance in the media space. Ultimately, for the other issues I talked about, governance, finance, uh, they mostly have to trust that what ISK tells them they're doing is actually happening. Uh, it's difficult, if not impossible, to validate in many cases. But media production is different, as they, and of course the rest of the world, uh, sees the end result, and they're prepared to take action if their guidance is not followed. So to sum up, um, the existing literature on cooperation between terrorist entities uh, looks at cooperation across three areas, ideological, logistical, and operational. For IS and ISK, while ideological cooperation is probably the most important um, and is present in the materials, in terms of sheer numbers, the bulk of communications were really uh, in, the, uh, in terms of logistical cooperation. Op operational cooperation was more limited by comparison. IS certainly wanted uh, to be kept up to date on ISK's uh, operational activity, but does not appear to have been very directive in terms of dictating ISK operations on the front end. This is most likely due to practical realities and not wanting to limit the Wallaya's operational tempo, tempo or flexibility. Probably the best work out there on the mechanics of how terrorist groups uh, manage their operations and their relationships is Jake Shapiro's book, The Terrorist Dilemma. It's a fantastic book. Uh, for those who haven't read it, the dilemma is this. He says, leaders need to control how violence is executed and how finances are managed, but the tools to do so create operational vulnerabilities and therefore increase the likelihood of operatives being caught and a group compromised. So if we're to apply that to, to this particular case, IAS clearly feels it's worth the risk to try to exert this level of control. And while I'm not going to stand here today and tie together specific terrorist and counter-terrorist uh, actions, I think we can assume that their efforts to communicate and do these things probably played a role in the key losses ISK has experienced uh, over the last couple of years, three Wally's killed in two years. Um, but despite these losses, they have persisted, and that's the real challenge. It'll be interesting to try to assess how certain environmental factors and changes, such as advances in encrypted communications, uh, have reduced the risk Shapiro highlights as limiting factors to exerting control. IS and ISK were certainly in regular communication for a long time before some of those individuals involved were removed from the battlefield. Uh, we've talked a lot at this conference about the use of technology, um, and I definitely feel this is a growth area for our field. So uh, in sum, this project is a work in progress, and there's certainly gaps that we're working to fill, uh, but hopefully this was enough to drive home the value that, that research, the research community can add by conducting strategic analysis of this type of material. Um, access to this material is a unique advantage that we have and can be married with our other sources of data to present a more complete picture of our adversaries and their trajectory. So thanks for your time. Um, I look forward to seeing you out there. Thank you.